Okay, welcome everybody to the 2022 Melville Nellis Hoffman Annual Lecture in Environmental History. Um, my name is Sean Karaj. I'm the Vice Dean and Associate Dean Programs for the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, but more importantly, a member of the Department of History um, and uh, one of the colleagues in the environmental history field. Uh, I want to begin by um, acknowledging the land on which our university stands, but perhaps we aren't sitting or standing currently. Um, we are virtual, of course, today, so we could be joining from all different parts of the world. I see Ellen Arnold definitely is not in Canada, She's joining us from the far off lands of the United States, perhaps, uh, or further abroad. So if you aren't joining us from the Toronto area, we just ask that you uh, take a moment to acknowledge the territories uh, on which you may be joining us. York University recognizes that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which our campuses are located, relationships that precede the establishment of the university. Uh, we acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations in the area known as Takranto, which has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It's now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And we acknowledge that this territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Um, so I would like to give some welcoming uh, remarks to our speaker uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, Bathsheba DeMuth, um, and uh, thank her for uh, joining us and delivering this year's lecture on behalf of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies and Dean J.J. McMurtry, uh, who unfortunately wasn't able to attend and sent his, his horrible vice dean uh, in his place. So here I am uh, and excited to get to see the lecture this afternoon. Um, I'll turn things over now to my colleague, Carolyn Perducini, uh, who will introduce our speaker. Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, before I get down to welcoming the speaker, I just want to say a couple of words about the Melville Nels Hoffman uh, Annual Lecture in Environmental Studies. So we've been blessed to have a whole array of amazing environmental historians over the years in our department. And um, these um, uh, the senior um, environmental historians uh, have decided to create an annual lecture series and generously donated funds to make that possible for us. So I'd like to give a shout out to two of those uh, professors who are with us today, and that is Richard Hoffman and Viv Nels. And so thank you so much for your generosity and your spirit and your past work in um, enabling this series to happen and uh, for us to continue being a source of strength and uh, development in environmental studies. And I also want to give a shout out to Eleanor Melville, who unfortunately has passed away. And she's a scholar who worked on environmental history in Mexico, and uh, hence the source of my knowledge about ungulate oscillations, which I'm excited to possibly hear about today. And so uh, she's here in spirit and always in our minds and hearts. Um, so it gives me wonderful pleasure to introduce Bathsheba Demo. So she's a really remarkable historian on so many fronts. She met earlier with our graduate students, and I learned the process by which she was able to get her award-winning book, Floating Coast, published by Norton, which she very casually said, oh, publishers are, are trade publishers are very interested in publishing history. And I think she's being really modest because I, I seriously don't think that any historian at all, could, you know, maybe one or two in the world could walk into Norton and say, hey, I have this great topic. So it's really a measure of the remarkable work she's done. I also learned about her this morning that she went into a program not knowing that she was going to be creating Beringia as a field of study and worked with a committee uh, that did not know much about environmental history or Beringia. And uh, that's what made her book I, and dissertation and later book so special is that she had the knowledge in the back of her mind that she always had to sell this to a group of non-specialists that really wasn't that interested in the topic. And la voila, we've ended up with this really wonderful book. Um, so just a few words about this book, Floating Coast. Uh, so this came out um, a couple of years ago, 2019, and it was named um, Nature Top 10 Book of 2019, uh, the journal Nature. And um, it also was the uh, best book of 2019 by NPR, Kirkus Reviews, and the Library Journal, among others. So you can see the tremendous range of audiences that her book is appealing to. And it's 
her power, I believe, as a storyteller and also as a teacher of environmental histories and histories of North. So she did a couple of degrees at uh, Brown University and then a couple of degrees at uh, Berkeley before returning to Brown, where she um, sort of still is an assistant professor, but all the paperwork has gone through for promotion to um, associate tenured professor, which will take effect July 1st. So huge congratulations for that wonderful milestone. So that's, of course, not at all surprising to hear, but very happy for us to hear. Um, so without further ado, I present you with um, Bathsheba Demuth. So thank you so much for that really generous um, welcome, Caroline. And it's it's a real pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. I particularly appreciate people spending time on Zoom now that we're in year two of Zoom school. Um, I know that the fatigue is real and um, I really appreciate it. I would have loved to join you in person, um, but I'm also glad that we planned for this particular mode given, um, given the pandemic wave that we're in once again. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Viv and Richard and um, in the memory of Eleanor for uh, endowing this lecture series, which has had such an amazing line of speakers. And I actually look to it every year to be like, whose book have, you know, maybe I haven't heard of it and should read. So um, I think of this series as being one of the real kind of place setters for environmental history. And it, it's in a tremendous honor um, to join you. Um, from where I live uh, right now, which is on unceded Narragansett and Wapanoag lands um, on the state now known as Rhode Island. Um, so once again, it's just my honor to be joining you wherever you are across the world. I wanna start with a, a very brief disclaimer just to sort of set expectations. Um, climate is in the title of this lecture, um, but I'm actually not really a historian of past climates. Um, I'm more of a historian who passes um, any time that I possibly can in a climate that can look from temperate places fairly extreme um, in the Arctic and subarctic, uh, in Russia and North America. And it's also a part of the world where you don't need uh, to visit an archive um, or look at a, an ice core to see climate change happening. These polar parts of the world are warming at about twice the rate, and in some cases more than twice the rate, um, of the temperate zones on Earth, meaning that the kind of anomalies that uh, people who live in the far north are experiencing in the present are in some ways premonitions of uh, the, the temperate zones experiences to come. Um, it also means that I find it important to talk about uh, things to do with how people imagine the Arctic climate, which is part of what will come up today, along with a discussion not just of the history of a particular part of the world, um, but the ways in which we have come to approach telling it and what those narratives mean um, as we go about thinking of ourselves in this present moment. So the part of the world um, that I'm going to sort of take you to today um, is on the Chukchi Peninsula, which is on the left-hand side of the map or maybe it's the right-hand side. I can never remember if Zoom flips the orientation or not. Um, it's the one labeled Chukchi Peninsula, which just to kind of give you a sense of where it is in Russia is so far to the Northeast that it's closer to Boston than it is to Moscow. And I was traveling there several years ago um, on a road that kind of moves North in the Chukchi Peninsula toward an area where reindeer brigades um, spend part of their summer um, along this river called the Omvam, uh, which is the Chukchi name. The Chukchi are the indigenous folks who live in the interior part of the Chukchi Peninsula. Um, and I was on a road kind of heading toward the village on the map that's called Omguema. And I was traveling with a young Chukchi man named Alex, um, who has distant relatives up in Omguema and we were bringing them gifts for an upcoming celebration. So we were traveling in a truck that was full of biscuits and sugar and candles and bread and tinned butter and evaporated milk and boxes of tea and big bags of hard candy for the kids. And one of the strange parts of being a historian and perhaps particularly being an environmental historian is that you often come to places and landscapes that you already know in some form through the archives. 
I had never been to this part of Chukotka before physically, but I had walked there the way that we do in our profession in the company of the dead. And what the dead told me about this part of the peninsula, not too far from the Bering Sea, was to pack warm. In Vladivostok archives, I had read about August snow squalls on the tundra, and in Moscow about ice forming on water, at least by early September. But in 2018, I was not even in a sweater. In this part of the Arctic that year was the hottest summer in recorded memory. All through June and July, people would say in an offhand way or with worry or with a kind of dark humor that it's the end of the world or that it's Armageddon. And these conversations are part of a larger trend. The first word of what remains the most widely read article about climate change in English language in English by David Wallace Wells is doomsday. Scholars working on theories of social collapse from Joseph Tainter to Peter Turchin to Jared Diamond offer grim takes on the general state of the world based on resource use and past climate fluctuation. Even the tenor of much climate history with exceptions of work by Dagmar de Prout and others give a fairly dubious view of past societal responses to perturbations in the climate which is grim news, given that just a few weeks after I left Russia in 2018, scientists at the IPCC gave the world 12 years to reduce carbon emissions or risk warming so great that it was headlined across the world as climate apocalypse. That number of years, of course, is now down to less than nine. The foreboding is so intense that climate change has become the background moral dread to popular fiction from Jenny Offel's novel, Weather, to Christine Smallwood's academic satire, Life of the Mind, both of which pit daily life against the looming shadow of climate catastrophe. So the narrative mode of apocalypse is very present for the far North in particular, but for the human future in general. We are constantly given prophecies of rupture being trained as a historian makes it hard to see such stories as neutral. They shape the borders of our minds and of our politics. I spent much of that trip to Chukotka wondering, what is the attraction of these narratives of absolute end? And what are the meanings that slink in when we proclaim the apocalypse? I want to take you with me over the course of this talk on that trip and through the pasts that Alex and I encountered as we drove north, from Chukchi theories of history to Bolshevik aspirations for the future. Both speak to what apocalyptic narratives, the allure of ending worlds and what they foreclose, and to the experience of surviving actual worlds ending. It is a historical exploration, but also one that is a bit obsessed as I am with thinking about what the tools and modes of history can offer to us in our present. One of the dead in whose company I have passed some time is a man named Karl Janovich Lux. He was dark haired and handsome from what his photographs tell us. Um, and when he wrote the following from Chukotka in the 1920s, he was a young man. He wrote, quote, the Chukchi are the majority of the native population of the Chukchi Peninsula. Under the czars, these natives were only of interest as suppliers of fur. Nobody gave a thought to protecting the base of the native economy, to improving his way of life. As a result, the fur trade was nearly extinguished and reindeer husbandry fell off catastrophically. To fix this destruction is our task. In Carl's life is a history of apocalyptic allure, of what sings to us beyond the horizon of the demolished now. He was born on the, Rus the western edge of the Russian Empire in 1888 to peasant parents who were so destitute that his father nearly sold an infant Carl to the childless baron who owned the lands that his parents worked. As a boy, he tended cattle. Around him, most people were confined to agricultural toil on old noble estates or to industrial toil on, in new factories. 
His parents were unable to afford education beyond basic literacy, so Carl became a deckhand when he was hardly more than a child. His voyages took him through Baltic ports that in the late 19th century were thrumming with discontent. Strikers protested factories that rent their bodies, bread lines turned into riots after days of hunger, students demanded representative government, Tsar Nicholas II, heir to four centuries of autocratic rule, sheltered in his palaces, spent lavishly, and hired more police. The people that Karl met outside these aristocratic walls found their presence so unjust, so sickly, and so impossible that the general societal question was not would it end, but how. Karl heard Baptists preaching hellfire, Orthodox priests invoking the salvation of saints, and dozens of other sects calling down the final judgment. And these visions all shared a rough plot. First, there would be the apocalypse, and then a reign of harmony and perfection. And it's a very old story, one that has passed from the Middle East to Europe, from Jewish cosmologies to Christian traditions, and goes back almost 3,000 years to the prophecies of Zoroaster, who foretold a cataclysmic battle between light and dark. The triumph of light would give the righteous a new life, one without suffering or toil. Cycles of birth and death would end, and the world would be immortal and linear. But Carl did not become a Baptist or worship saints. He joined a socialist reading circle. In the historian Yuri Sloskin's masterful reading of the Russian socialist condition, the plot that Karl learned amongst his socialists also came from Zoroaster's lineage. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels foretold how the darkness of capitalist exploitation would become the light of communist utopia. Between these poles was a kind of earthly revelation or what socialists call revolution. A word that Sloskin reminds us promises the end of the old world and the beginning of a new just one. I first met Karl in an age crumpled file in Vladivostok where I learned what he would give for this new world. At 17, he was arrested for distributing illegal pamphlets. For the next decade, he was in and out of custody. Karl left a four year term in Oriel Central Penitentiary, which is the prison in the bottom uh, vision of the screen here with tuberculosis. In his autobiography, he described being bound by a guard by ropes that ate into my body to the bones at my hands and feet, which were so swollen and blackened, it was impossible to control them. When Vladimir Lenin brought the revolution to Russia in the bitterly cold and hunger filled winter of 1917, Karl was in Siberian exile. He joined Lenin's army there when it reached the north and then moved to Chukotka. He was tasked by the new Soviet government with quote, liquidating the consequences of centuries old historical injustices from the tundra. So when Karl wrote to fix this destruction is our task, part of what he meant was, we shall end the unjust world and beyond it is a life without want. I find much to admire in the purity of Karl's vision. He went to prison and into exile to help found the kingdom of freedom on earth. So you might say from his example that one appeal of the apocalypse is that it can make those on its threshold feel world historically important. But what about this place that Karl went to, Chukotka? Chukotka is first and foremost reindeer country, and it has been at least since the end of the last ice age. Reindeer are animals who are almost never alone and almost never still. They move constantly to find fresh pasture and breezes that help keep mosquitoes from tormenting their flesh in the summer. As I have learned from some time spent with them, they make a gently percussive sound as they walk, as the tendon in their hooves snaps over the sesamoid bone so that being around a herd is kind of gently percussive on the edges. Chukotka is also Chukchi country. 
and it has been in Chukchi history far back into deep time. In that past, reindeer have always been important, but they're also animals with a changing and dynamic relationship with Chukchi. Centuries before the first Russian speakers came to the Chukchi Peninsula, the Chukchi primarily hunted wild reindeer. But at some point, three or 400 years ago, or maybe even five, Chukchi and wild reindeer struck a bargain in the relations that we call domestication. Reindeer who lived as familiars with people were protected from wolves and bears. People who lived as familiars with reindeer were protected from hunger. In the history that Chukchi tell of themselves, a few dozen domesticated reindeer made food and shelter newly dependable. Hundreds or thousands of domesticated reindeer made politics newly potent as the bodies of many reindeer carried the authority of gifts and armies fed for war. In the 1700s, the Chukchi fought and won battles against the Russian empire, expelling them except for trade purposes, which were minimized to the margins of the Chukchi Peninsula. Yet as powerful as the reindeer made the Chukchi, to walk out with a herd on a tundra morning was to also enter a world where human authority did not extend fully even to the tame animals shuffling outside Chukchi tents. Chukotka's hills were home to many beings, to mushroom-shaped men and giants with gaping mouths and wild reindeer people, any of whom could steal a herd. Some of these beings were kin and some were foes. Valleys, rivers, reindeer, foxes, and walruses all bore souls that required human entreaty. To live required supplication and a frank acknowledgement of dependence on beings other than humans. That is, Chukchi social life was made up of persons, not all of whom were human. Many were reindeer. Chukchi theories of history took from this a sense that time contained linear aspects like the domestication of reindeer, but also was caught in patterns of time that spooled out over the land cyclically. These Chukchi observations of time in the Arctic have a synchronicity or a resonant with contemporary scientific understandings of the historical climate um, and its relationship to species in this part of the world. Since the last ice age, the Arctic has seen cyclical ups and downs in climate temperature in which roughly every 100 to 50 years comes a spate of slightly warmer years, usually less than a half a degree Celsius. For reindeer, these warm decades, or even a few warm years, bring intertwined peril. Cold air in the far north reduces precipitation, so there's less snowfall, which makes it much easier for reindeer to get to food. But in warm winters, herds founder in deep snow and can starve, sometimes in large numbers. Particularly deadly for reindeer is a phenomenon when the air warms enough for precipitation to become rain, fall onto snow, form a crust of ice, and create a situation in which reindeer cannot dig through to get to the grass beneath. And even in warm summers, boggy land leaves reindeer hooves exposed to infection, hinders migration, and frequently leads to outbreaks of anthrax. For the Chukchi observing these cyclical ups and downs in reindeer numbers, the Arctic climate worked through reindeer to influence life and politics. A family, a rich family with 5,000 reindeer could over the course of a decade find themselves with only hundreds, enough for food, but not for armies. There were no hereditary leaders as a result, or fixed hierarchies. Such things were laughable. To walk out on an Arctic morning was an appeal always to a will-filled universe. As one Chukchi man told an ethnographer not long after Carl Lux was born, nothing created by man has any power. Carl, whether we're talking about Lux or Marx, would not agree. Freedom, as Frederick Engels wrote, consists in the control over ourselves and over external nature. Liberation in this Marxist view came from bending every resource to human need and only humans could be free. It was the fundamental plot for Marx and Engels. 
this capacity for progress that drew societies from hunting and gathering to agriculture, to industrial capitalism, and then onward toward the revolution, beyond which there would be no suffering or decay. The idea of time that Karl Lux brought with him to Chukotka was therefore aggressively linear. On the tundra, with this linear idea of history, Karl's task was to identify external nature to control. Chukotka was too cold for agriculture and too distant from central Russia and too rugged for much, much industry. But there were reindeer with useful meat and there were foxes with valuable pelts. And there were people that in the Bolshevik view of history that Karl brought with him needed saving from the boot heel of nature. So a fleet of missionaries of the new culture and the new Soviet state, as one follower of Marx put it, came north to teach the Chukchi about Lenin, like this young teacher in the photo here, while others designed new methods of reindeer corralling and pasturing and systems of fox pens and barns. The goal was to eradicate the fluxes in reindeer and fox populations. Out on the tundra, in a temporality different than that of reindeer, fox numbers tended to rise and fall every few years, dependent on cycles of lemmings. But the goal was for socialist farms to replace such inconsistency with predictable growth. This required very different techniques of relating to both animals. Caged foxes would live in barns where Chukchi would work um, in sort of long factory-like days rather than spending their time on the tundra setting traps um, in thickets where foxes prowl. This meant that Chukchi could live in town in apartments with electricity and running water while their children, Carl wrote, could attend, quote, a first-class school, not in the native dialect for a real Soviet education. Carl did not ask the Chukchi if they wanted this new world and no one else did either. Nor did anyone ask the foxes about the pens or the reindeer about the corrals. To do so was not in the Soviet way of doing things thinkable. Another appeal of the apocalypse is that proclaiming it is not an act of supplication, but of great certainty. In Shukotka, in retrospect, this kind of certainty can look like a kind of madness. But Karl Lux did not live to see most of it transpire. In 1932, he took an accidental bullet while surveying foxes and reindeer and other life on the Chang River in Shukotka's Northwest. As he bled to death, or so the Soviet reports go, he begged his fellow revolutionaries to continue their work in the most remote places inhabited by natives, no matter the victims and in spite of any cost. In 2018, when I traveled north to Anguema with Alex, Alex told me how many of the victims that Carl invoked and who came after him were Chukchi. We did not want to live in the way that the Soviets said was correct, Carl explained. All around us as we drove were ruins of the world that Carl had tried to build. From these abandoned apartment blocks to the remnants of old gulag built uh, cabins like this one. The way of life that these structures built into Chukotka's land, settled, electrified, educated in Russian, did not signal the promised land to Alex's ancestors the way that it did for Carl. The Chukchi did not want to give their reindeer to Soviet farms or take day-long shifts in dark fox barns. They did not want to give over their visions of creation the raven that made their land long ago, or the boy born from a reindeer's ear for the stories that Bolsheviks told. Bouncing north toward the Omvam River in 2018, I thought about the Bolshevik teacher whose memoir I had read. He had described pointing to a portrait of Lenin in the corner of a tent and explaining how he that we see hanging on the wall taught all people will live well only when they themselves make their own lives. In response, the Chukchi elder that the teacher was speaking to responded, what you say is nonsense. Doesn't he know that we make our own lives? 
for ourselves. And after all, the Chukchi, who had begun domesticating reindeer hundreds of years before the Soviets arrived, knew the power of their animals. They knew that reindeer allowed them autonomy, allowing individuals to amass wealth in herds of thousands, and were not particularly interested when the Soviets asked them to collectivize their herds, to relinquish all notion of private property and create collective farms called kalkhoz. The Chukchi received me warmly and willingly talked about general abstract themes and topics that did not directly concern reindeer, one young Bolshevik reported. But when issues began touching on the deer and reindeer herding, the Chukchi became very wary and stopped talking. Reports like this filled the Soviet archives in the decades after Karl died. And in the 20 or so years after his death, the difference between how the Soviets understood the future and how the Chukchi wished to shape it for themselves bubbled over into violence across the tundra. As the Soviet Union tried to collectivize reindeer with increasing force in the Stalinist years, the Chukchi began killing their own stock in order to save them from becoming collectivized. Sometimes there were open small wars, histories of violence that ran across the Chukchi land. Violence that is for the most part invisible now, but has left histories right under the surface of any conversation. Around and after this violence, Soviet scientists mapped the hills and the tundra and the rivers with the desire to radically simplify the tundra landscape. In short, they wanted to turn it into a space that was amenable only for reindeer. To do so, scientists studied tundra plants for methods of rational use. They developed vaccines for reindeer against anthrax and other diseases, dusted them with DDT to protect them from insects, and bred the herds for size and temperament. The Soviet archives are dense with studies on the use of reindeer milk, reindeer sinew, reindeer hides, and reindeer fat. Wherever possible, reindeer herding was mechanized given over not to the kind of work that Chukchi were used to by domest using domesticated reindeer to pull sleds, but through a kind of fossil fewer labor where possible, where tanks and snow machines pulled people and their equipment across the landscape. And wolves were hunted aggressively from helicopters and poisoned by hundreds. The purpose of these interventions was the creation of more reindeer since more reindeer were a sign of the arrival of Karl Lux's dream, a linear history, one that was defined by an increase in productivity on the tundra. On that tundra, Chukchi were still in regular relation with reindeer, but the husbandry that they participated in, particularly by the 1950s and the 60s, required formal education, which was found in town. Herding brigades would live in town for most of the year and would be helicoptered out to the tundra to work with reindeer in shifts in blocks of time of a week or a month where they would not spend time with their families as was traditional, but rather um, communicate with a kolkhoz manager by radio and sometimes their family as well. Well, women and children stayed in town. Children went to school, women worked on fox farms. It was an attempt to make reindeer work look as much as possible like factory work for an animal that has to migrate in order to stay alive. And like Soviet factory work anywhere, there were problems. Tractors took years to arrive, people drank too much and read too little. But by the 1970s, the correct socialist form was in place, a way of organizing reindeer in large collectives that were oriented toward the good of the Soviet Union and the creation of what one Soviet reindeer breeder called first rank workers of the tundra, people of a new type who unflinchingly and every year achieve high indices in the field of reindeer breeding. You can tell from that quote how exciting some of the Soviet archives are to read. One Soviet scientist went so far as to argue that the revolution had brought such a new form of organizing reindeer to the tundra that growth would be infinite the ultimate linear dream of time. Progress unending, 
and an escape from the limits that moss and lichen and the necessity of relating to other life impose on any ecosystem. It is an irony at the heart of the Marxist project, or at least the Soviet variant. In the attempt to free human beings from exploitation, all other life became mere resource. Which is something else about the apocalypse. Its battles, in this version anyway, only damn or save human beings. In this story, our species has no kin but ourselves. On that trip in 2018, we reached the Omvam River by midday. A quarter of a mile or so from its banks is the village of Anguema. It's a Soviet town with concrete buildings connected by elevated gas pipes shedding old insulation. Entropy has taken over the outskirts, pulling down houses, filling the space between with fireweed. But at the center, there are new curtains and open windows and bright paint on the concrete. We stopped to speak with a group of men in rubber boots spattered in mud. One of them introduced himself as the mayor and they were digging a drainage ditch, he explained. The tundra under the town is seeping. Alex asked if the reindeer brigades were close. The mayor pointed us west toward the river. If they have returned, he said, their yoronga, their reindeer hide tents will be over there. He advised that we walk. Since the fall, he explained, the roads have decayed. In Chukotka, when somebody says the fall, what they mean is the Soviet Union ceasing to exist. By then, the early 1990s, the socialist efforts to control the Chukotkan land had changed many things. It had built the roads that we were driving on, the apartment blocks, brought children into schools, herded reindeer with helicopters and snow machines, and put foxes inside fox pens and barns. Chukotka became the Soviet version of the world that we now find normal, where lights come on with a switch and ships bring goods from distant places. But the Soviet Union never did quite mold time into linear form. Even before the USSR sundered, reindeer herds began defying Soviet prophecy and declined due to a series of warm years. Foxes kept dying of rabies and distemper so that Carl's most apocalyptic promise, the freedom from any natural constraint, proved impossible. And then in the 1990s, what had changed disappeared. In my profession, the question of the Soviet collapse is often one of why. Was it the economy? Was it the politics? Was it the ideology? But in Chukotka, stories about the 1990s bend toward the how. How did we survive a civilization in its ending? All that the Soviets brought with them, the gas heat and the bakeries, the machines and the medicine was no more. Alex was a child when the electricity shut off. There was no gasoline to move supplies and there were no supplies to move anyway. For the better part of a decade, the region experienced a kind of crash decarbonization with the withdrawal of nearly all fossil fuel power. And it is not a model of how to decarbonize. Older people died without medicine or heat. Mothers worried that a lack of food meant little milk for their infants and everything was cold. People described the horizon of time closing around them. What would the summer bring that would keep families whole and towns alive through the winter? And what would the winter do? Fox barns emptied and untended reindeer went feral or were lost by the hundreds to wolves. And in people's memories of this period, each day came with specific small tasks of survival. Chukchi families set up Yoranga inside their apartments and burned seal oil lamps for warmth and light. Through summer and fall, they picked berries and greens and packed them in seal fat for the winter. It was good to know hunters who lived along the coast in the villages where elders still remembered how to kill bowhead whales without specialized equipment. It was also good to know how to tend reindeer without helicopters, how to sew reindeer hide boots, how to harness a reindeer when the snow machines ran out of fuel. Much of what kept people alive were small things, easily overlooked and dismissed, the kind of things that often appear in historical records as mere chores or the women's work of caring. But regardless of gender, solidarity, 
that old socialist refrain ceased to be a slogan and became a necessity. At the end of the world, there are no damned and saved souls, only people and other kin to share in the work of making life possible. No one knew it would happen, Alex told me. We couldn't just hope it would end. The trick to surviving was in knowing something about the land and the animals and in keeping on without any certainty whatsoever. We made our way to the river on that afternoon in 2019 toward the cloud-like Yorongas sitting on its bank. From within one of them, a voice hollered out a hello and asked if we wanted tea. Stooping inside, I was briefly blinded by the smoke which rose from a small fire. And near the coals sat an older man and a woman who introduced themselves as Grigori and Anna. We gave our names and sat cross-legged with them on the reindeer skins passing over our gifts and drinking tea. The conversation then looped between Russian and Chukchi, so I did not understand all of it. There were relatives to discuss, news from wider, wider Russia to pass on about what Putin was doing in Moscow. I caught that Grigori and Anna were born just after the Chukchi and the Soviets ceased killing each other in the 1950s and were nearly grandparents by the time of the collapse. Their sons now work in Anguema part of the year, but were out at the time with the reindeer. They sell some of the meat in Chukotka's larger towns and sell the antlers to China where they're used medicinally and keep the rest along with the skins for their relatives. The tundra where the reindeer graze has also grown strange. There were new insects, Grigori explained, beetles that the Chukchi have no words for and which eat some of the same plants as the reindeer. Anna was worried about chemicals and cancer from what the Soviets left behind in their military installations, but also from the garbage that she said washes up on the Bering Sea coast and makes its way up the rivers after every storm. What does it leach into the fish that we all eat, she asked. And then as everyone always eventually turns to, there was the weather. Grigori talked about deep snow and rains that came late into fall the past years. And we all looked down at our tea. No one knows what's going to happen, Grigori said. It's probably a good idea to buy more rubber boots. On that afternoon on the Onvam River, I was almost exactly the same age as Carl looks when he wrote, to fix this destruction is our task. And we have other things in common. I also came of age or am of age in a world too precarious and unjust to continue with impunity. The people with power spend lavishly and hire more police. In the United States, our national politics leads more to the poor selling their children to the wealthy than the wealthy stealing, sorry, leads less to the poor selling their children to the wealthy than the wealthy stealing children's futures, carbon atom by carbon atom. And all around us are whispers at the end. We live in late capitalism, people say, implying an imminent sundown, or we live in the sixth extinction, calling up a void with a phrase. We live in a climate emergency, a crisis. A thing terribly more than change. The grimmest of these prophecies tells an old story, the ultimate battle in which an unlivable climate will drive out the darkness that humans have become, as if the end of human failing is our extinction. The core of this kind of apocalyptic thinking I have come to believe is nihilism. This world is too despoiled to continue. And the seduction of such stories is in how certain they make the teller feel. An apocalyptic narrative is like looking at a horizon with no clouds or hills. The way forward is terribly assured. And to walk it, there is no need to mind the lives of others who are rendered invisible by the power of imagining that they're already gone. An apocalyptic prophecy is also an escape from contemplating, from seeing in the here and now, how life goes on even through catastrophe. The Chukotkan Riverbank in Amguema has borne two world endings in the past century. The end of the world without socialists, 
and the end of the world with them. The story that these endings have etched into the earth bears little relation to Zoroaster's final battle or the pure cleansing fire of Karl's revolution. What the land here speaks instead is a tale in which rupture is never complete. No revolution excises the quotidian, the need to rise and sleep, to nourish and shelter, to care for new birth and imminent deaths. This is just the insurmountable stuff of being. In the company of Chukotka's dead and living, I have come to think that the most terrifying thing about our future is not just what will change or grow uncanny or cease, but what must continue on regardless. And all of this had been visible on the drive to Amguema. Over almost a hundred kilometers, the road was marked by sequential clots of debris, by rusted things and broken things and shelters that had been left open to the sky. One way to see this aspect of Chukotka is as a land that is unrelentingly scarred, a place that is befouled by Soviet remnants, an earth that's beyond saving. But another is a site of ongoing restitution. The mare down on the mud, making another livable year in his town, the reindeer rib that fed us in Grigori and Anna's tent, or a fox raising a new generation inside a lidless, rusted oil barrel. One thing that Chukwutka makes clear is how we all live in the company of the dead. And we are all also future deaths ourselves, which brings a question, what presence will we be for the lives that come after us? And I think that to fix destruction is our task, but what if that mandate summoned not Karl Lux's delusions of escape and human grandeur, but repair? It is not an easy task, I don't think. It will take all of what I find inspiring in Karl Lux's life, how he worked hard and collectively how he believed that justice was possible and that equity was critical. Our uneasy world needs his courage and his bodily sacrifice. But Lux also warns us not to simply look for easy hope. He did not write of it in prison, nor did do Chukchi talk about survival as relying on hope in the 1990s. Instead, both offer stories with clear diagnostic, diagnostics of injustice, they worry, and they speak of action. But Chukotka's history also carries other lessons. It asks that we, particularly those of us so privileged as to be imagining the end of the world for the first time, trade the temptation of apocalypse and its escapism for a world historical humility. It asks for perseverance without certainty, for prophecies that hold space for more than people. Perhaps most of all, Chukotka is a lesson in how restoring what has broken is a reminder to be careful of what is here and now. It is an entreaty to make things that last, to create better ruins, and to care for what will outlast our small, tender lives. Thank you. <laughs>